Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you have enough coffee. If not, please go get more coffee quickly. We're about to start. I'm Gory Fairhurst. I'm here for the second time. Nice to see some people again. This is the longer TSBWG meeting, and I'm here with my co-chair, who is? I'm Martin, and welcome to TSBWG. This is the note well. Please read it. Um, please read it. Uh, it has important information regarding copyright, intellectual property, uh, patents. Uh, it also has our code of conduct, and we take that seriously here. We already have, oh, there's a question for, uh, regarding the note well. Please, go ahead. Apparently, we don't have a question. Uh, yes, I mean, for the remotes, please. As I am remote. Yes. Hmm. What's your question? I can, okay. I can barely hear you. So if uh, somebody could adjust the sound increase the volume for the remote it would be great thank you i don't know if anyone's in me techo but maybe that sounds like a me techo problem we don't we have good audio in this room so perhaps um if you consider you have a problem please put it in the chat and we will try and get me techo to look at it now, when you spoke into the mic, it was perfect. Okay, great. Um, we already have a note taker. Thanks a lot for that. We are using the Meet Echo mic queue here. Um, if you want to, if you have any questions or want to comment, please get into the queue. If you're not in the queue, you're not allowed to speak. And this is our agenda for today. We have a lot, um, a lot of things. Um, we will start with, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna read everything out loud here and that will take too much time. Um, that's the second part of the agenda. Um, any objections to that agenda? That is not the case. So we will proceed. Can you say that? Yeah. Okay. Um, there is one slide in the slide deck last meeting for the one hour TSBWG session, which we didn't manage to show. Is the speaker for that on the, uh, what was the draft code? Do you remember, Martin? All oh, protocol numbers in UDP options is 
Is the author of that in the room? Let's show the let's show the first slide and move on. Is this one? Q, go ahead, please. This question. No. Uh, regarding this uh, business of uh, the local numbers in the option. Um, Christian, this is just a wait, Christian. This is not a debate on this document. It is purely an announcement. The document exists and ask the people to read it in the group because I think okay. we've been discussing. So we're not presenting okay. it this time. Yeah, thanks. You're and welcome. I think probably this discussion we've already had here is enough to alert people to go read that draft. We will show the draft name at the end when we get to it. And we will proceed with the agenda for today. Sorted. Oh, is it me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Gory Ferher is going to stop being chair and start being presenter. Um, hi, I'm Gory Fairhurst. I'm one of the core editors of the careful convergence of congestion control from retained state. ID. This is now a working group item. A quick reminder, it's got an algorithm. The algorithm is meant to test some information you previously had about a path, congestion control state, uh, when you know there's a lot of uh, capacity available. Last time you used it, you know the RTT. Last time you used a path, and you start reusing this path, it then decides if the path is the same. We call that reconnaissance. If it is, then the method attempts to jump to the previous rate or a subset of the previous rate in what we call the unvalidated phase. Unvalidated means you're not really allowed to do it, but we think it is safe. And you look for validation that that capacity was actually available. This is the yellow part of the graph. And hopefully you proceed out of the top in normal phase with normal congestion control when all that works well. The tricky bit, of course, is all when this all goes wrong. So the bottom bit of this graph shows the red reconnaissance phase. You discover the RTT is different to normal, in which case you follow the dotted line, which means you don't actually do the jump or change your congestion controller in any way. If at any time during the reconnaissance and unvalidated phases, you discover negative feedback that there was congestion on the path, that the RTT is very different to what you thought it was, be it higher, be it lower. This is an indication that something is not consistent. And immediately you need to do a safe retreat. The word retreat is cute because it's a new mechanism we don't quite know how to define, but we have some good ideas. So this is what this, this piece of work is about. Um, hopefully with this one picture, you might feel enthusiastic to go and read the draft and help us do this. So. Let me continue. Um, this is a protocol spec. So we have changed the status to PS, submitted it. There was an adoption call. It was adopted. We've aligned terms throughout the document so that the various authors all use the same language to talk about the same things. Or so we think. Please ask if you think they're not consistent. We added some little text on flow control interactions. More of that fun later. Next, we have started to try and implement, which is the main reason for standing up here now in front of you. We have an NS3 model of careful resume for TCP. It's available if you wish to play with it. Uh, we include high start plus plus, which isn't currently an NS3 in other places. And well, go look here, go talk to uh, Rafael Osechi, uh, who will happily collaborate with you if you want to play with that. We have a Linux fork of Careful Resume to play with. Um, it uses Cubic, uses FQ, does some form of pacing. 
um, is providing data to us. We are playing with careful resume for quick. That is an important target. And we've been playing with Pico quick and looking at doing this in quiche. And that importantly includes the BDP frame, which I'm not going to talk about, but I'm going to mention because it is an important part of this whole puzzle. Next one. Um, well, we have some results. Um, if you want to try and figure out how much benefit you get from this, it's about four RTTs for the right size of transfer. Um, if I had more time, I would do the longer talk I have in ICCRG. There is no ICCRG, so I'm simply showing you data and saying you get about four RTTs of benefit if you get this right. Um, we can explain why that is, but that's kind of the order. If you think that's too small to be worth doing, then tell us. If you think that's too much, well, I don't think it does matter to some people, so really it helps. Martin. Uh, the other Martin, Google. Uh, so four RTEs versus doing nothing, or four RTEs versus like naively jumping to the, to the BDP? <laughs> um, right, okay, so yeah, okay. It's four RTTs versus slow start, right? If you naively jump to the BDP, you play Russian roulette, you win or lose. And unfortunately, if you jump to the BDP without pacing, you lose. If you do this without pacing, you probably also lose. If you do pacing, you also lose. So four RTTs is what you can probably get. It's governed by maths. Three RTTs if you pace really carefully, and somewhere between the two if you do something nice. I'm saying this not because I want you to kind of stare at the data and worry. I'm trying to indicate how much benefit we're actually talking about because it would seem like it was enormous. Well, it is enormous in time, but it's a finite amount. Let's go. Next slide, please. Um, that's the same graph in a different way, the same sort of data. Um, um, IW10 takes a long time to complete basic message. So start was not great but slow starts needed because if you don't do pacing on something careful, you will stomp on things. Next slide. Um, oh, this is the pacing story. Um, let's be clear that pacing is important. Left side shows no pacing and then a jump after the 10th acknowledgement comes back. So you do this reconnaissance phase, you get acknowledgement for 10 pack packets you have sent, you figure out the RTT was okay, you figure out the path is not overly congested, and then you jump without pacing. Um, all happens quite quickly, but the chances are that you actually then overflow a buffer. So you need to do pacing. So if you pace IW and then jump at the 10th pack, then you actually waste time pacing out IW before you start the 10th get to the 10th hack, and then you can send the data. So pacing IW does cost you in terms of time. Whether that gives you benefit or not, I don't want to comment on. If you want to do it, you can do it. But it does cost you something in time. So next slide, hopefully, is this. We can do a compromise, which is what we currently think is probably best, which is either do the first one, um, no pacing of IW, jump and pace the jump. That makes sense to me. Don't do the middle one, which is pace IW and then pace the jump, because you do pacing twice, it costs you twice in terms of the delay. Or the third option is pace IW, but the first act you get back, declare that that act is the start of your invalidated jump. Keep counting all the ones in that reconnaissance phase as indications of whether your RTT was right and give up immediately, you find something was wrong. Seems like a compromise. It is a trade-off, um, but it gives you basically the same amount of time for bundling all these packets together. Happy to take questions. I'm trying to just bubble up things so we can talk about them on the mailing list. Martin is in the queue, I see. Yeah, I'm trying and I failed, so uh, thank you. Um, Martin Duke again, Google. Uh, so good work. I, I guess it's just really interesting. Um, but I'm going to suggest like maybe a bunch more work. Oh yeah, which, sure. Which is that, uh, so it seems like C wind resumption is like a, is a communication from the implementation to itself yes. ultimately. Right. And, um, 
at least what you presented here is one half of that communication. Um, like the naive way to 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 like cache the 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 C wind is just to take a snapshot of the C wind in the RTT at the end of the connection, which like might be anywhere on the sawtooth. So I'm wondering if you have any insight as to like how to properly do that, how to properly buffer the BDP in the first place, and and like if that should be part of part of the scope of this document. It is. It's called the observe phase, and it's the elephant bit which I kept out of the room. Oh, <laughs> okay. And yeah, um, that that's important. Um, let's. Um, okay, so we have being careful. We have some notion of pacing because you have to have some act clock or pacing mechanism when you're going to send at the high rate. Mm -hmm. And we have, how did you find out in the first place? And what does that mean when you have more than one flow starting with the same piece of information? So that bit we haven't looked at. And all of this stuff we're going to work on. So this is not a fait accompli. These are the issues so that everybody understands that these are things we need to do work on. Okay, thank you. Um, two more questions. Um, who's top queue? Christian? Go ahead. The, an, an answer to Martin Duke's question. Uh, yes, if you pick the BDP, the BDP and the RTP at a random time in the connection, you get a random result. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so I think we should probably add to the draft some guidance on that. What is done in the PicoQuick implementation is that uh, PicoQuick waits for the slow start to complete and then the connection to stabilize, and then it it picks uh, the, the BDP and the RTT to remember. But that's one implementation, there may be others. Thanks, Christian. And Christian also can contribute the test, he's one of the editors. Um, the You can also get this very wrong as well by choosing the um, RTT and the amount of data in flight at the very end of your connection when you're not sending anything, which means you get zero. <laughs> So, um, so clearly there is a way of deciding what capacity you actually saw, which is sensible. Matt, please. Yes, Matt Mathis, independent. Um, this is all done with Quick, with Pico Quick, or did you do experiments with TCP? I'm wondering if the, you dealt with the receiver window problem. Please watch. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fun bits. Kazuhu is next. Go ahead. All right, so uh, I'm novice to this area, so please forgive me if my question is incorrect, but I, I told I get the... Can you move closer to the mic, please? Ah, sorry. So my question is, I told I get the fact that you need a variation phase uh, for TCP, but in case of quick, uh, you, you can determine how many packets actually you went to, when, through to the other side because ACK has the accurate information. Then I tend to wonder why we need the variation phase at all for quick. DT. Which phase? Uh, the, the reconnaissance phase. The reconnaissance phase. The reconnaissance phase is primarily to do two things. Number one is it's to not do the jump right immediately because if the path has really changed a lot, that's a really evil thing to do. Although it might seem helpful, it would be an RTT less, but it can be really catastrophic in terms of the effect of the flows. And what would you want to do in that phase? What you want to do in that phase is primarily confirm that the path is not com severely congested and that the RTT is the same. You need quite a few RTT samples to actually know that the path is anywhere near mm -hmm. what it was last time. So these are the two things in reconnaissance phase that the path is not overly congested, and that you have an RTT sample you can believe in. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Michael Tuxen. Um So you are using the RTT and BDP from some earlier time. Yes. Do you have any idea how long this can be? Thank you. Elephant. Um, yeah, this is the observation information. It's um, how long in the past do you believe this information to be true for? Um, what happens if you want to start two flows? What happens if you want to use half the information you previously had? This all becomes like control block sharing questions. And hopefully we have some information in the TCP control block sharing regime, which we can use to start with. But yeah, these are questions we have to answer, which is why it probably has to be an RFC. 
Okay, right, well, um, that was fun. Next slide. Uh, oh, um, well, let, let's not do this. this. This just shows the effect of pacing. And actually, if you do pacing in different ways, you can actually get the result you might need. Pacing is a bit of a black art. How many packets do you pace? How, uh, how over what period? All of this can be done. So we're experimenting with it. More data at ICCRG next time. Next slide. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how do we do this? Um, and why don't we have a lot more data? Well, we put it into TCP. And we kind of tried to address the issues apart from the observation issues. Um, and we tried it. And lo and behold, the first thing you see is something you probably might have expected, but you don't get a jump you get a little bit of a jump in multiple steps. So the graph on the right shows the green line for how you actually increase your sending rate. And the blue line is the jump which we tried to do using careful resume. So we judge the reconnaissance phase, it's safe to jump. We increase sea wind in a step function. And lo and behold, the minimum of sea wind and R wind is R wind says, you don't need much receiver window at the moment. Therefore, you can't send anything. And then you rely on TCP auto-tuning to try and figure out that actually you can send a lot more. And gradually it works up. And after another RTT or two, you get the rate you want. So our wind or auto-tuning of the receiver window is a big deal. Um, you get this wrong, then you don't get the benefit. Um, should that be changed? It's not, I don't know. Um, okay, why did this suddenly appear? It suddenly appeared because we put it into TCP and we really wanted to do it in quick. And for quick, we had a BDP frame ex extension. The BDP frame extension is a transport parameter you send end to end saying, this is the size I'm going to use in the reconnaissance phase. The receiver then knows they can do the flow credit adjustment based on what they understand, and then you can take advantage, which is how Pico Quick and the Quick side actually managed to do the jump. For TCP, that was um, that requires more thinking of, and we've only got this far so far to say you need to think about flow control in Quick in TCP. Sorry, because Quick is a different solution. Matt. Yes. The point of the window receiver window auto tuning is to prevent the situation where you get too much memory that you're not actually using yeah and there's a trade-off there and it's a policy you you could change that algorithm in all sorts of ways and and you can also imagine that at some point quick is going to have to deal with the same problem and so it's going to have it's 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 a design problem which is common to both um i actually tried to make a statement earlier and fumbled my raising my hand uh, so I'm sorry to go to go back. The problem of how to decay information after when you have a silence, that is actually a, pro, a sub problem of congestion control, which is ideal for machine learning. It's actually context specific and adaptive. Well, okay. And I would like to encourage somebody to do research of, on answering that question in a general way, that specific sub question in a general way using ML strategies. I'm not going to do it. Okay, so if I understand paraphrasing you, the observation, in other words, determining the, the jump you think is acceptable from what previous you, you saw is something that actually we could learn from in different ways in different environments. And you, can, you want to learn it from your own traffic, your own mix. Yeah. And so, so my solution doesn't help your solution. Okay, that might be fun. And yep, yeah, um, okay, um, just saying adopted a work item and we have work. I think standing here longer isn't going to help anyone. Uh, please join us. Next slide. We don't have a single fixed solution for these. We believe we have the capability to produce at least one alternative for each of our problems. We will come and present them. If ICCRG meets, we will say less here and we will go there and we will present lots of data and show you things in Prague. Please come and join us. Any more questions? Cool, thank you.
next up is MP DCCP. Yep. Hello, everyone. Markus Arment, Deutsche Telekom, standing here on behalf of the authors of the MP DCCP draft. And I want to give you some update on the progress. Next slide, please. Yep. So we incorporated uh, Gori's early review uh, that is also part now of the, or finally completed in the last available version of the MPDCCP draft. Uh, mainly it was incorporated with pull request 191 um, and some, some, some subsequent uh, PRs uh, after discussion we had with Gori. So everything is merged. Um, there's also a first review available from Olivier. I think one of you know them. He were very much engaged in the multipass TCP, but also now in the multipass quick uh, standardization. Um, so we took all of his review comments and um, added them to the GitHub issue tracker. Uh, there is one comment about optimization of the handshaking procedure, which was raised by Olivier, and I have some slides on that to discuss this with you. Um, in the meantime, also the RFC status changed from experimental to PS uh, after some discussion on the mailing list. Uh, and last but not least, um, we also optimized uh, the prototype handling. Um, we have the MPDCCP implemented as part of the Linux kernel out of tree. Um, and that one we automated now. So with every merge of new code, there will be an automatic build and uh, we provide this build as a Debian package so it can be easily integrated into any Debian compatible OS. Um, yeah, we had a jump of three versions since last IETF. So in version eight, we mainly added a section on parts usage strategies, which mainly said that um, scheduling, reordering, uh, congestion control is out of scope of of, out of scope uh, in the context of concurrent path handling. In version nine, we uh, changed then after the mailing list discussion, uh, the document status to PS and started to incorporate most of Gori's review comments. And this week we published version 10 to complete Gori's review. Next slide. Okay, coming now to the optimized handshaking procedure which was raised by Olivier in issue 225 and 248. Um, when we started with the MPDCCP, I think we had a strong look on multipass TCP and we adopted mainly the handshaking principle of multipass TCP because I think it's quite safe. It was uh, discussed in, in IETF and in the meanwhile, we have two MPDCP RFCs available. So yeah. That, that was the reason why we adopted it. However, uh, the MPTCP handshaking uh, principle used a workaround to cope with a limited option header size. Um, and that is something we will see then on the next slide uh, is related um, to the exchange of keys and um, to the process how to derive, derive tokens which are then used to authenticate subsequent flows of the multipath uh, connection. Um, this principle in multipath TCP requires a costly collision check before or during key generation. Um, and this is probably not necessary because MPTC, MPDCCP provides a la larger header space. So we do not need to integrate this workaround of multipath TCP. And that is mainly what Olivier raised. And we think that is a good point. And um, we also have a proposal how to improve this without, um, uh, yeah, without um, having a, a huge modification of the handshaking principle. There was also a second point um, where Olivier asked to remove, um, asked for the removal of the key A information in the final leg of the initial handshake. We also see this now in the next slide. So please go to slide four. Okay. So let's have first a look on the left side. So that is so far the, the key exchange uh, principle. So in the upper, upper red part, uh, that is what Olivier addressed in 248, uh, that it is not required to exchange here key A. Um, 
I have to admit that was a historical leftover um, and we can safely remove it. Um, when we decided to add here key A, we found it what would be a good idea to confirm again that key uh, to, to uh, send this again to host B so that has B, that host B um, has again the possibility to check if key A was correctly uh, received in the beginning of the handshake. Um, but when we now thought about it again, I think that is not needed because we have DCCP checksumes. So if it would fail or if we do not correctly uh, transmit key A in the beginning of the handshake, uh, then there would, this would be recognized um, with a checksume check. So we do not have, or we have not to do it again. So we can safely remove it, which means in the final act, we only transmit the key B to confirm that the key B was correctly received on host A. The second point um, is now addressing um, that we have some larger header space available and what we propose, and now I would like to ask you to focus on the right side, um, that we add a connection identifier in the initial exchange. That is something which was not possible in MPTCP because not enough header space was available. Um, and we add now a connection identifier, which then can be used later on to, um, to authenticate or to let subsequent flows be joined to a multipath connection. So that is what we propose here to exchange uh, connection identifier A and connection identifier B. Uh, and then in the MP join process, uh, we use this connection identifier instead of the derived token, uh, which was introduced with multipass TCP. So from our perspective, that is a small change, but has a huge impact because we don't need the collision check anymore when we generate uh, key A. Uh, we only have to ensure that uh, key A, key B are unique in the system, but I think that can be simply done. Um, and we have not to go uh, through a list um, of existing um, derived tokens to check uh, if they are already in the system. So quite simple, and that brings me to the next slide. So the consequence is, as you have seen, uh, we have now introduced a connection identifier, uh, which is um, initially exchanged along with the keys. Um, and the subsequent subflow establishment, uh, you then the connection identifier to identify the right multipass connection where it belongs to, or where it wants to belong to. Uh, that is then part of the MP join and simply replace the token. Um, what does it mean for the draft? Uh, the MP key, option needs some extension. So we have to define a field to carry the connection identifier. Um, and for sure, we also have to um, adapt the text around the token generation, which is not needed anymore, um, and have now to explain how to use the connection identifier. Uh, regarding 248, uh, that's even more simple. So we just have to remove from the, uh, from the draft the exchange of the key A and the final ACK of the initial exchange. Um, yeah, that means we have to change one sentence in the draft. Um, yeah, and that brings me now to, to the question which I would like to ask you. Do you share the view that this is just a minimal adaptation of the handshaking procedure? Remember, uh, we just introduced the connection identifier and replaced the token with that. Um, and our view is also uh, that the security principle is not changed because we keep all the HMAC authentication procedure and so on. Um, yeah, here yeah, I would like to get your feedback. Gori. Gori Fair is just talking from the floor. This looks like an interesting thing to do because um, you had machinery there which was basically inherited from a fixing TCP. So I think it's a good call out that we could do things better and simpler. So I quite like this as an individual. 
Um, is it similar to what MP Quick does in terms of logic? Um, I'm not the absolute expert in Quick or Multipass Quick, but as far as I know, they also use a connection identifier. So I think, yeah, it's it's a similar procedure, or well, at least the basic idea is the same. I would have thought it was very similar from what I recall. So that's maybe worth a quick cross check, or if anyone else wants to comment, um, be interested in knowing whether this is now a kind of good practice because we're also doing it in MP Quick. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Q is empty, which let me believe that this is a good design decision. Um, and I would like to ask you to go to the last slide. Yeah, summary. Okay. Um, so the authors believe that we are ready for working group last call, assuming that the last issues can be solved before next IETF. Um, the last issues we see that is um, incorporating Olivier's first review, which he shared on the mailing list uh, two weeks ago. Um, what we did already here is um, to integrate this into the GitHub issue tracker. So I think we have now 24 issues available. Most of them are minor. Um, the largest one is I think around this handshaking procedure thing I, I presented to you. Um, so we believe uh, after analyzing all the issues, all the comments uh, that we can solve this in a reasonable time frame, And we already addressed or commented most of these issues. So as soon as vacation time is over, I think we can make a lot of progress here and we can complete it. Okay, a couple of chairs questions. Firstly, to the editors. How long do you think you need to resolve the issues you have currently pending and to check through anything that people see in response to those? So assuming that, that Olivier is available after vacation time, I think, um, and we have enough focus on that, uh, maybe one and a half months. Okay. Thank you. And you then see no further work? So at least in the issue tracker, we don't have anything available. Um, we, we have the confidence from the interop test. We already presented um, one of the last IETFs uh, that everything works out or works as expected. So no, we don't see any remaining issues at the moment. Okay, so question to the working group as a whole. I'm going to ask if you think this might be ready for a working group last call or whether you think that there is likely to be additional work. And since this is a not a consensus call, it's simply a feeling of the room, we get to use a hum. So please hum if you think, subject to the issues being completed here, that this document might be <laughs> that was disruptive because our AD just got up and ran out of the room as soon as I said I'm going to call a hum. Um, apart from Martin, um, if you think this that subject to the issues being addressed, which are currently in GitHub and the resulting discussion that follows, this document will then be ready for a working group last call. Please hum now. I see a mild hum. The important one, please hum now if you think this document will not be ready and there are significant issues to be addressed which will take more time than having a working group last call by the next meeting. So if you think it, there are more issues pending, more review is needed, please hum now. So I call this as a few people uh, like to hum to say the first outcome and nobody I noticed um, hummed for the second one. So with that data point, we expect as chairs that this will be revised in one or two more revisions and then we will start a working group last call procedure to publish this as a proposed standard. Thank you for your contribution to this meeting. Yeah, Any have, questions? Yeah, I have a final question. So I recognized throughout the process from changing from experimental to PS that the milestone is not available anymore in the data tracker. Maybe that is something we can 
fix. Yeah, but I mean, before our AD left the room, he pressed all the buttons when it's all fixed. Ah, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So it is, a, it is a PS milestone that gives you a date by which we expect to see it published. We do plan to do a working group last call on the list, hopefully prior to the next IETF, um, so that at the next IETF we can resolve post working group last call comments. That would be our plan. Thank you. The next topic is DTLS and SCTP. This has been a fun topic on the mailing list. We should start by saying this is part of a discussion we expect to become um, even more discussion over the next few months as we get this all scoped correctly. And the chairs are aware of the fact that some of these documents will have to be repackaged into different internet drafts and that is something that we are considering for an interim meeting of this working group in September. But I will let Magnus talk about the details of everything. Yes. So um, there are actually two set of drafts here, but uh, and uh, I think we can go on uh, to the next slide. So the goal of this presentation is really to ensure that we present the thing. Recap where we are, etc. See what the trade-offs are between the different proposals, and ensure that we can actually go. That as many you understand what's going into this interim meeting in in a short time, where we'll have a chance to really in detail discuss the aspects and and try to get to a consensus after that. Hopefully, have a consensus call and and select one solution going forward. Um, and, and this is really focused around what 3DPP asked for this. I mean, this whole work started now, I think it's two years ago, by 3DPP noting that they had two large messages to fit within RFC 683. We found this during the work, we found more security issues with the SCTP OAuth and, and 683. So we're working on, on trying to resolve these. And in this process, what the detail is over SCTP solution, we will talk more about. Uh, we found it hmm, lacking in a number of issues and, and we did a second proposed individual that which is, I'm gonna compare later in this slide. Um, so we can go forward. Um, I have included in this presentation the relevant, we did get an LS response before this meeting from 3DP PSA3. If you step two slides forward, I think. Oh yeah, the IPR declarations. Um, so um, there's several different set of IPR declarations depending on, on the which draft it is. So that's, yep, can go forward. Uh, one more, I think, because this is the first. So, so this is the LS we received most recently. Uh, basically two things to, take from this is to say note that they uh, in the end of this second paragraph in, in, on the left column you have uh, since the problem is related to the use of DTLS with the SA3's understanding is that the solution should be based on DTLS and the solution should not rely on unsupported DTLS features uh, and the next sentence SC3 can only ask TSBW to work on and publish a solution as soon as possible so Hannes. Hi, this is Hannes. Um, yeah, one, one aspect, of course, SCTP is not only used by, by the 3GPP, but uh, um, what in the discussion, one important aspect what was what the 3GPP specifically trying to constrain regarding the message size, because there has been some uncertainty about that, some sort of like so i didn't understood where the let, let's go on to the next slide so i will come back i will explain what we see as the requirements mm -hmm. and where they're coming from mm -hmm. um so i have this on a coming slide okay so if you move slide forward 
I think we're actually on. Yes. So, <laughs> so the message sizes, uh, these are the theoretical maximum sizes from some of this protocol that we know. So we have a, a S1 AP and the specification that's defined in. And we have the XM protocol where we somewhere about, about around 500 kilobytes theoretical maximum sizes. So is what's need to be protected. So, um, but what it doesn't say, like how these messages like come together, like why, well, like 142 kilobytes sounds like a little bit of random. I assume you also, you yourself almost wrote uh, the requirements in the 3GPP to pass it on over here, right? So, I mean, this is uh, the 3DPP defined user protocol that's on top of the SCTP stack that's generating these messages. And these protocol uses two streams, if I, most of them, and they send them the different user protocol message. There's several different messages in some of these protocols, I think, depending on what for different purposes. But some of these generate messages, an uh, individual SCTP message of this size. So, hmm. like, um, I'm always suspicious uh, when things bubble over from some organization to the other one because I have been working for a network equipment manufacturer myself. And so the way how things were done back then was you go to one organization, write the requirements and then pass it on to the other organization to basically hand it from the same person to, the, to, the, to yourself kind of and say <laughs> like, here are the requirements. So I was, I was expecting a little bit more than just saying like there's some specification that says so many kilobytes that conveniently Fits so so I go back to read the original LS for yeah. the task. They basically are saying we have larger message than 16K. That was the original thing. Yeah. Yes. And we tried in this saying, okay, what have we found that is theoretical maximum sizes? That doesn't mean that they currently used in this size. It just means that they could grow. And they, in some of these cases, my understanding is that they're based on how, for example, how many UEs are in a cell. The more UEs, the more larger this message becomes. So uh, I, I would implore you to actually go read maybe the 3 dpp specs for these interfaces if you actually want to understand that they are, to my understanding, these are not just dreamt up things. It, there's a real problem here. Otherwise, I wouldn't spend two years working on this either, Helmus. So. Michael Tuxen, mm -hmm. um having theoretical limits is fine. It would be really good, I think, if we would get some practical limits. So I think, for example, diameter has a 24-bit length field, and you normally don't use that length. So it will be good to know what we actually have to deal with. OK. Um, so I mean, the solution to that would be to ask them, um, 3D people, about, OK, what's the actual required pra practical limit? Uh, as, as one of the outcomes of this is to write an LS, we could we could put in such a question, um, so, but, so. Like what... uh, one other <coughs> question. Um, it says good modern security practices, um, forward secrecy, cool. Periodic rekeying re with ECDHE um, in, for example, uh, one could argue that TLS 1.3 is a modern security protocol and the key update, for example, doesn't use, for the rekeying, doesn't use ECDHE. Yes, and that's the problem here from our perspective is that we see uh, because of these very long lived sessions, which a number of the other users, especially, I think, a lot of TLS 1.3, if you go back to that, it's, it's, it's been, feels like it's very driven a lot of web use cases where it's fairly easy to tear down and restart in many of those use cases. So if you have this problem, you can always trigger a new uh, Diffie Hellman handshake which isn't the case here, because if you do this in some of these cases, you're actually disconnecting all the UEs from the cell, which is not a good way of forcing a rekeying. So Right. But the interesting thing is, like, DLS and DTLS 1.3 have also sort of tried to meet the security requirements of industrial IoT applications, which have even longer uh, lifetimes, connection lifetimes. And there, that was not an issue. So I... Yeah, it's okay, but it's, it's, it depends on what thing. I mean, a single industrial IoT application, yes. Uh, it might be that, um, 
but we see that and we see that there's some requirements etc from some national regulators etc also to have uh, mutual reauthentication and and try to prevent uh, the risk of or exposure from if any key exfiltration happens so yeah um, i it like i can't get rid of the feeling that the requirements are written as solutions rather than specific requirements so if you actually go read the security consideration, we do link in the detail SSTP uh, working group document. We are pointing to some of the reference where we see why we're taking those approaches. So, But even there, I'm also suspicious because you have uh, been developing a solution uh, and it's, it's not clear what came first, the solution or the requirements for the solution. You, you know yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it's not it's, the first time that this happened. No, we saying we we did have the at least from the author's perspective, we had we would say sit down and say, okay, what is the requirement actually to do, do a good solution for this here? But yes, um, so it's so. Um, I think I gone through all of these. Basically, talked about this about this. The long-lived sessions that we see the need for mutual reauthentication and periodic rekeying, and where we can actually break the key chain. That's as, as we see it. So, uh, yeah. Uh, next slide. So um, the current working group document uh, describes a solution where you have details on top of uh, SCTP. Uh, we define this as an adaptation layer in, for SCTP, and that adaptation layer contains um, the fragmentation of the messages as well as logic for doing or how to handle the rekeying by creating new uh, new DTLS session that's are uh, doing the handshakes uh, across the SCTP message and using. Detailers connection ID to identify the different sessions, being able to have one uh, detailers connection live while you st establish the, the new one, switch over to using the new one, and then tear it down when you're certain that all messages protected by the old connection is has been processed. So that's the kind of solution here for this. Uh, if we go to the next slide, the New, new slide is a, a new solution is that we propose is in CryptoShunk. Um, so that's a split where we're actually trying to do the protection on individual SCTP packet levels, which means that the fragmentation of SCTP message, etc., is using the normal SCTP, me SCTP mechanism. Uh, you have the record processing done on each uh, packet, and then you need to key this, and that's done from basically something on top of the SCTP stack, it's using SCTP data, sending SCTP messages with the key handshakes, and then keying up the record processing. Um, so, yeah. see if I missed anything. Um, yeah, so I think we can go on to actually the differences. So one of the reasons we're uh, Go, went down this road for the other proposal is that we actually see that we had problems with the finding and, and detailer stack that could fill the requirements of detailers over SCTP. So um, you need connection IDs. Um, that's not a particularly well implemented feature at any of the de detailer stack. Basically, the only, and this is based on basically Googling research, looking into GitHub issues, etc., for what's been addressed, etc., requests for features and things like that. Looking um, um, plus the what's what's supported. So, um, so the CryptoShank solution doesn't require connection IDs. We worked around that. You also st staying on IP packets uh, MTUs. Yeah, Hannes. Um for the availability of the stack, what what does that refer to? Does that refer to implementation of the whole solution or does it ask for it? Is there a DLS or a DTLS stack available? I'm I'm trying to answer if, if there's a DTLS stack that appears at least on spec paper level mm -hmm. to support the features we need. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
but uh, so for example, um, okay, so you may have some extensions that you make use of that uh, are not the Bollinger specific stack, mm -hmm. which of course you could add. Uh, yeah, yeah. Since so, you're so, specifying yes. it, but yeah. um, like in in general, like Wolf, the Wolf SSL guys have a DLS 1.3 and a DDLS 1.3 stack. Yes. Know? And so. And and yeah. And why, why, for example, that there's a DTLS 1.2 stack in MPTLS. Uh, um... So the, the right column there is, is basically embedded TLS, to my understanding. You, I think you implemented yourself the connection ID feature for that. And you have, so you have support, and therefore, you can at least do that. The question mark is, I haven't dig into the APIs, or if you can turn off replay, how you deal with replay protection and, or key, key updating. Mm -hmm. But, but so that's basically why it's a question mark. I am yeah. saying that this is features. The whole point with this slide is pointing out that there seems to be poor availability of the off-shelf. So you could always, as if you need this, okay, you can go request or pay for having these features implementable. They are defined, etc. Everything. So it's it's not that it's not solvable. It's just saying at this point in time, this is the is the availability. Right. So a part of the input here is to say, okay, mm -hmm. what do you need to be able to actually implement and deploy this? And it means, yes, you're going to have to touch the detailer stack. Yeah, I, what I'm wondering is like why you mention it specifically, because uh, you, you also come up with a lot of new stuff, uh, which obviously is not implemented anywhere. Um, and then you are comparing it to saying, oh, but the TLS implement the one feature in TLS is not available. I need to add it, so I could as well implement everything from scratch. I think it feels like an odd, like the message is sometimes uh, is unclear on like why you why you state that. So because other ones earlier in this discussion has raised questions about the availability of the stacks, and it is, and it's quite like common to say, okay, people the TLS stack taking it off the shelves, and the point here is your may or probably not going to be able to take an off-the-shelf stack and use it. Well, so An off-the-shelf stack. Uh, there's, yes. there, like, the, the TLS working group has been working on like 20 plus years on different features. So, like There's no such concept as an off-the-shelf stack if you want to have different features, right? Yeah, so, but it's, it's what the currently available stacks that exist out there that's kind of in fair amount of use is relevant, I think, for some of us. That's, yeah. I'm, yeah. I just want to point out that many of the things that you recently came up with are not implemented, not available anywhere in any stack. No, but because they are completely brand new designs. So, and then com you compare it against, oh, I can reuse ninety-five percent, but I have to add this five percent. So, yeah, but it's it's the question of saying where where are you implementing this in some cases, and and how is this is is like okay. Uh, because the features we are implementing in, in most of the features you're implementing here is directly in relation to your SCTP stack or a layer directly on top of SCTP. Yeah. Adding something to SCTP stack and adding something to TLS is both requires effort. Yeah, they require effort, yes. Mm. But it, it's uh, from the perspective of, of, of who is the owner of the stack, etc. It's uh, so, but yeah. Um, I, point taken. So, um, um, yeah. Since we are talking, uh, we are, right now you are comparing two solutions which both have IPRs. Yep. Um, so I think talking about what's available in open source decks is the use of that is limited. So that's why I would suggest oh, can we focus on one DTLS version? No matter what. I mean, Personally, I don't care if it's yeah. one or two or one or three. I, I would go with one or three, but I don't yeah. see a value in supporting two versions which have different uh, things. So it it complicates either solution. Yeah, I I fully agree, and and that was a question we asked at our meeting if we could go with a one point three only, and the answer we got at that point was no. Maybe now we moved on a bit further, we can have it, and that's I think is a question. That's a good question to bring into the interim meeting. Um, so, okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on. So um, the next 
big issue why we proposed a, a different solution has to do with rekeying robustness. And the problem here is really about that when you do something on top of SCTP, you have multiple messages, multiple streams. Not everything is happening in order. There's a potential here for reordering aspects of between and especially also packet losses. You might get one message uh, and another is delayed because of uh, packet loss. Uh, you might have been not sending it yet, but it's scheduled for transmission at the sender side, etc. So the problem with the uh, details over SCTP solution, from my perspective, has been around that it's actually hard to figure out when a packet has, or is saying an individual details record is fully delivered and consumed. Because if you would actually remove the key for that details record prior to actually consumed all the records, you're actually causing a data loss for data that is can have been act as reading received by the uh, from the sender's perspective, and and that would cause a data loss, which would basically mean that you should tear down the connection to avoid that data loss to become a real big problem. So for years we have this uh, habit of putting socket API considerations mm -hmm. in the documents and. Mm -hmm at least the Linux and FreeBSD kernel implementations I know follow this stuff. We have APIs for that yeah. in the documents. So there is a way to do exactly this. It might, in, in the DTLS specification, we haven't written it in the language of the socket API because the socket API is informational. But um, if that's an issue, we can have a generic description there and another informational section where we say, this is how you, you would do it with a socket API. And this is done, for example, in, in the OpenSSL but, but, implementation. But Michael, to my understanding, that requires draining. You need to it see it's the dry event that, you, that exists. In, when we wrote the original one, yeah. we wanted to, uh, when we uh, get rid of a DTLS epoch, we wanted to get rid of the SCTP key, the, the corresponding keys in the SCTP layer. So mm. yes, we had to drain. Mm. If you are willing to accept that at the SCTP layer, we still have the keys from the previous epoch, mm. then you can come over this draining thing, um, I would say, in reality. Yeah. So yes, I agree. It, it's just that as you need going to need to implement further tracking than the API to actually be able to. Sure, but that's doable. Yeah, yes, but it's, yes. Um, yeah, um, next slide. Uh, Magnus, you have yeah. six slides and zero yeah. seconds. So, yes, yeah, so let's So which ones do you want to go for? Keep I going. think we'll go for the conclusion slide, what the next steps is. So we can, uh, yes. Um, so um, as you see, this is something that's both things requires actually to consider the proposals, consider what your requirements have, what, what you have in, in your implementation, et cetera. Uh, so um, the proposed way forward here is to try to maximize the input into this question and be having time for a more detailed discussion is to have an interim meeting. The proposed date is the 19th of September at 1600 uh, Central European time uh, for two hours. Might be some additional topics that's consumed this part of the time, but it's to have more, much more time to discuss this matter. Um, and uh, from my perspective, after that, it's probably a reasonable, hopefully, time where we can do some consensus calls, etc. cetera, for, for way forward here. I also want to send a liaison statement to 3 dppsa 3 and RON3 to inform them about the interim meeting. And we can also request additional clarification. Uh, SA3 is meeting in basically two and a half weeks' time. So we need to get this LS out quickly. So by mid, somewhere mid, mid next week. So it makes it into the queue, et cetera. But I have been working on a draft. I will uh, do a couple of more uh, edits and sends out to the mailing list so we can discuss the content of that LS on the mailing list. So, Hannes? Um, I was 
as I mentioned initially, like SCDB is not only used by 3GBP, so it would be yes. good to also get some of the other uh, users in, on the board because they may have also something to say about the whole topic. They're very welcome to come, but we have discussed this for two years. No one else than 3GBP has shown any interest. So, but if you can find someone, please bring them. Well, if I'm, you know, um, let, let, I think it's more a call to the, to the chair some, uh, as well. Uh, so. I'll say something you can carry on, but uh, I think the, one of my reasons for liking this interim proposal is we try and construct a mental Venn diagram of what could be open source and more widely used, and the IETF might like to favor if there is energy to work on it, and what solves the immediate and rather specific requirements of 3GPP in the hope that we could produce one, two, or three RFCs finally that are uh, useful for both uses. Now, we have seen a lot of input from 3GPP, mainly channeled via Magnus, but also I know with Nokia's input uh, for other things. If other people want to come and bubble up stuff that would really help with that, or make statements on things like, hey, we really shouldn't be doing TLS 1.2 anymore, or really, we should really look at this, then this is the ideal moment to try and do that, where we can have a bit of time and discuss it. So, Hannes, I'm saying yes, Please bubble these things up. Yeah. We ran out of time. There's a bit more information in the slide deck. So if you're interested in this topic, please have a look. And please discuss. Um, the chairs do want to have by the Prague ITF a set of chartered items for this work. And that will be different to the currently, current set of items. If you're interested in formulation of these, please be active in that period because we can't go on just discussing this at IETF meetings without making progress. Oh, different topic though. This one we have made progress on. Michael, zero checksum, please. Yeah, Michael Turkson, can you go to the next slide? Um, this is about a very simple extension to SCDP, which um, reflects the fact that some use cases of SCTP have uh, speci uh, specific methods which give you error protection or error detection, uh, which is at least as good as the CSC32, which is included in the SCTP common header. And therefore, it's uh, the CPU cycles spent on sending and receiving are not worth doing. So, um, this extension allows the receiver to declare that it is willing to accept SCTP packets with an incorrect checksum of zero. And based on the discussion, I mean, and, and the, the main motivation for this is uh, SCTP for data channels and WebRTC, where the uh, SCTP runs over DTLS. So not like we saw in the past presentation as uh, DTLS over SCTP or DTLS in SCTP or something like this. So it's DTLS is the lower layer. And during the discussion, um, Ericsson suggested that we could also consider additional methods like if the packet is protected by the crypto chunk or if the packet is protected by the authentication chunk. Um, and so now the declaration of the support is I, uh, a site can send a message saying, I'm willing to accept uh, packets with incorrect zero checksum for, and I'm considering this as the alter, uh, alternative uh, or the alternate uh, detection method. Next slide. Yeah, that's that's the basically that's the the changes between the initial working group draft version and the current version. Um, we have a 32-bit field in the uh, message, which uh, I, uh, provides the information which error detection method is used. So um, there's, there will be an IANA registry, first come, first serve, for doing this. Um, we need to somehow synchronize the, I mean, uh, ha have an organized method of, of assigning these values, but I don't think an expert review or so is, is required. Next slide. The implementation status is that 
Um, it's implemented in the FreeBSD kernel and therefore in the uh, user SCTP user land stack, which is based on that. There's an independent implementation for the SCTP stack used by Google in the Chrome browser. Um, we have support in tooling like Packet Drill and Wireshark, and there are Packet Drill test scripts uh, available at that GitHub um, link, which you can use to test your implementation if you are using a socket API or if you want additional clarification how implementations might uh, implement this stuff. Next slide. Next step, uh, well, Submit Revision 02 was done an hour ago, um, which included some feedback from IANA. Um, so IANA is reviewing working group documents prior to the IETF, and they said, well, you can remove this word and, and this kind of stuff. So nothing really has changed, just to make IANA, from the, uh, IANA happy from the wording perspective. And Peter Lee had some uh, comments. Um, the document is done from my perspective or from the perspective of the authors, which includes people from Google and people from Mozilla. Um, so I'm happy to address any upcoming feedback, but I think the document is ready for working group last call and Gori is asking a question. Yep, uh, I'm going to ask as an individual because I can't bother walking over there uh, to the floor mic, but it's a floor question. Have you looked at IPv6? I understand the use case over DTLS and what DTLS gives, and that would be okay, but the document isn't restricted just to DTLS. Correct. And if you were to have the direct layering over IPv6, you do pick up extra requirements from the IPv6 specification. So as in, you shouldn't turn off your transport. Well, the document, the, so, docu the document says that you can only use this feature um, when two conditions are fulfilled. First one, there must be an alternate method, which is at least as good as CSC 32C. Running over IPv4, you don't have this. Running over IPv6, you don't have this. Running over auth or crypto, yeah. you have that. However, the second condition is that um, the endpoints must be sure that there are no middle boxes in between which expect a non-zero checksum. I think... As an individual, it may be interesting to make sure the IPv6 thing is particularly clear, since IPv6 expects a transport checksum. It is already there that, that when you run SCTP over DTLS, or wait a minute, wait. that you run SCTP over IPv6, um, mm -hmm. then you don't have an alternate method. Does it say IPv6 somewhere in the draft? No, it says, in general, if, if you don't have this method, you can't use it. So it applies to IPv6, IPv4. But I'm happy to take any sentence you want. I mean... Want, okay. Got, got the comment. Um, the quest, you also posed the question with group last call, so now I put my chair hat on and ask people, um, what are we going to ask? Who has read it? Let's do a poll on who has read this document 01 or 02, the difference being only the I and the feedback, I think. So who has read one of these two versions, 01 or 02 of the document? Are we in a position to try and do our last call? It's a bit of a binary thing. I mean, um, you don't have to raise your hand in the no, I haven't read it because I can see people in the room and I know how big the mailing list is, but how many people we got? Okay, so we have, some people have read it. We have some reviewers um, mm -hmm. and that also will come to play when we get to a working group last call. Um, can you call out the number? Six people have read the document. So it would be nice if this number could increase. More people have commented on the document. <laughs> it's also true. It might make sense to read the document before commenting on it. <laughs> or participate in the vote thing. Okay, so thanks for the poll. We'll record that seven people have uh, read it, um, according to uh, our poll here. And 
well, should we do the hum for general feeling? Because I like doing hums again. <laughs> Can we have a hum for people who feel that this document um, in the next version is ready for a working group last call? I'm really looking for the second one, which where I'll ask for people who feel that we are not comfortable with progressing. So please hum if you have read and think this document is ready for a working group last call. I hear some hum. Uh, please hum if you think this document has major work items to be addressed or is not ready for a working group last call in some way. Please hum if you think it's not ready. I don't hear feedback for the second hum. Okay, that puts us in a good position. And we expect to take comments from the list. Do you to prefer a new revision, which we will send for a working group last call? So all comments have been addressed right now. Yeah. So if I get new comments, I will submit the revision. I just gave you one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that sentence and, revision, and put a revision in. in yeah, hour. fine. Um, we're, we're going to head this document for working group last call in the interval before the next IETF meeting. <sighs> Putting a new hat on. Would you like to talk about this briefly? Yeah, this is about um, an individual document, which is a BIS document for RFC 16951. Next slide. Um, the document basically incorporates the considerations given in the other draft, which is uh, addressing an issue where some text was some some explicit uh, some situation is not explicitly described in RFC 6951. And talking to Martin and the previous transport ID, I think it was Magnus, um, what the suggestion was don't have a, a small document specifying the UDP encapsulation and then having another small document uh, adding another rule, but um, have a single document uh, to do this. And this is what this BIS document is about. It's technically complete. Um, it's implemented in the Linux kernel and the FreeBSD kernel, including the, um, uh, the change described in the uh, NCAPS considerations. I'll address any future comments, but I don't have anything in queue. Thank you, Michael. Next topic which is the L4S. Is, oh, is Jason, is Jason? Yes, do you see me? Do this remotely? Yeah. Yes. I am, Please yeah, go ahead. Yeah. thank you. I will, can you hear me all right? We can hear you. Great, perfect. So um, we've got two things um, that I'm going to update you about today. The first is, the uh, individual draft um, that's noted here, and the second is an update on our L4S experimental deployment. I think the, uh, the draft part is pretty easy. Um, I've gotten a bunch of feedback over the past uh, few months, and I've incorporated all of those changes into the most recent 02 revision. Uh, there are probably a couple of more minor things that I can tweak, but I think that within you know, the next month or so, I would love, you know, some direction from the chairs. Do you want me to pursue an individual draft uh, ISE sort of uh, path or make it a working group item? Um, you know, you don't have to answer it now, but that, that's, the, I think, the key next direction that I'll need on the draft. And then uh, next slide. So this section, um, that, which I'll use the rest of my time for, is about our L4S experimental deployment. Uh, so we announced it in June, and uh, we kicked it off a short time ago, just a few weeks ago. And um, you know, just running through some of our experiences. First, we had an ECN marking problem 
um, which initially was a little bit humorous. All of our validation tests were outbound um, and everything looked fine. Um, and then we missed that we had a basically a network policy that was um, bleaching these marks uh, on an inbound basis. So that was a bit of an oopsie. We found that, fixed it um, on all of our uh, CMTSs, so our uh, aggregation network gear. And, uh, and also validated that in packet capture. So that was interesting. The ancillary thing that we found, however, was that we were also inadvertently leaking some DSCP marks that were intended to only be internal uh, into customer networks. Um, and the result wa was really in the IEEE uh, Wi-Fi domain, um, which was that traffic would get inadvertently marked as background traffic using ACBK. Uh, so that was an oopsie. Um, probably didn't matter that much um, without uh, dual queue, but once you go to dual queue, it, it would be a bigger deal. So all of that got fixed um, over the last few weeks, which is good. We're now working on getting all of the, in anticipation, excuse me, anticipation of the, um, uh, NQB drafts getting DSCP 45 working end to end just because they're all the network policy stuff is connected. In terms of our deployment, um, we have two CMTS types in the network. We have what we would call our legacy integrated CMTSs and our newer virtual CMTSs. Uh, we're only using the newer virtual CMTS platform because it's um, totally software based and you know there's just a lot more agility there in terms of adding features and fixing bugs and so on. Those are also the areas where we've changed the spectrum split um, for our, our cable plant, which means in essence that people just have more upstream spectrum. Um, but uh, that, you know be that as it may, it's just easier to innovate on that platform. Next slide. Um, so there are four different types of cable modems that we're using, two of which are the ones that we control the software on, the Xfinity XB7 and 8, and then two of which are customer-owned uh, and managed and administered, the RSS33 and Netgear CM1000 V2. Um, and we've got a, a whole mix of different um, cases that we're testing out, some where it's uh, all of the functionality of cable modem, router, and Wi-Fi access point are in one device. Some where uh, the cable modem and the router or gateway are in one, but the Wi-Fi AP is separate. And then a third where you would have um, all of those functions uh, separate, or at least the cable modem functions separate from the uh, gateway router and uh, Wi-Fi AP. Um, and we're also testing uh, with Ethernet and Wi-Fi connections. So we're trying to get all of the different permutations of typical equipment that we would see to try to catch any potential um, issues or other problematic corner cases. Um, and, um, you know, planning to test out the different uh, Wi-Fi queues. I think here the, the big question is, does using a different 802.11 queue make a difference? for the low latency flow, or is it better just to throw them all into uh, best effort? So we'll see. Um, next slide. Um, I should also say, and this is remarkable and, and very interesting, I think, for this group. The level of customer interest we had here was pretty extraordinary. Um, and I'm talking like 20 or 30 times more interest in this type of a trial than I've ever seen in a prior trial. Um, and so uh, definitely set internal records for us. Um, and right now, this week, you know, we're still in the midst of employee trials, uh, which I'll talk about. Um, but one of the reasons that I'm not in the meeting in person is we're trying to get ready for the customer trials and pick all of the end users. So, you know, it's been a few weeks. Uh, July 11th was the first live modem uh, on the production network with dual queue. We've got um, 25, now it's a little bit more than that, about 30 modems active. Those are all employees right now. And I anticipate uh, sometime, probably looking like early August, we'll have hundreds and hundreds of customer modems activated. So the, the plan, and I'll, I'll talk about the next section in, in a moment, but the plan is when we come to Prague, we'll have a great readout of, you know, significant amount of customer testing, you know, lots of modem permutations, et cetera, to uh, share data on. Um, the way that we parse out the tests is by giving weekly test assignments that people can run, first phase sort of general diagnostics, FaceTime and other video conferencing gaming, 
and then other apps, that, you know, TBD. We've seeded out some ripe atlas and net microscope, uh, net microscope, uh, microscope, excuse me, probes. I want to say Microsoft, but that's not correct. Um, and uh, also just seeded out a uh, Sam Nose probe as well. Um, and we're talking to one other organization that has some probes they'd like to be deployed. Um, if there are any other tests that people are aware of, especially tests that are fairly uh, comprehensible for the average lay person, not an engineer, um, let us know. We're happy to have people run those tests and uh, you know, give, give any results back if, if they're not directly collected by whatever tool you have. Next slide. Uh, so tests are going to run July through September, probably will run longer. Um, we've been posting things on the L4S discuss list um, as interesting things come along and uh, anticipate sharing, as I said, um, a lot of results at 118. And we'll do some product launch decision making in the fourth quarter in terms of where we go next. So that's it. Happy to take any questions, but quick recap on the uh, first L4S experiment in the field. Thank you. Are there any questions from the room or from online? I love the teaser for what might come at the next meeting. So thank <laughs> you ever so much for that. We, um, you asked about um, possibly adopting your draft as a work item and we will Consider that and talk to our AD. Uh, we're not going to discuss that in the moment. Yep, no problem. Thank you very much. Greg? All right, Greg White, uh, Cable Labs. Um, good segue from uh, uh, Jason's uh, discussion about the early deployments of L4S in the network. Uh, this draft that I'll be talking about is uh, our working group draft that is intended to encapsulate guidance on uh, interacting or how L4S will interact with classic ECN, in particular single queue classic ECN bottlenecks in the network and ways to mitigate any potential issues there. Um, uh, the one big change is a new title. Uh, that was a discussion that uh, took place last fall, actually, that the original title was sounded a bit more um, comprehensive than the actual scope of the draft. Um, so hopefully this title is more focused and, and uh, people who are interested in this specific topic will, will find the draft. Um, anyway, next slide. <clears throat> um, so yeah, the, as I already stated, the scope of this is talking about uh, um, RFC 3168 bottlenecks in the network and how L4S interacts with those. Um, it has guidance for operators of end hosts, operators of network, uh, networks, and researchers to look for uh, potential issues that might exist. Um, the, in the discussions in the previous IETFs, we have talked about the value of keeping this document open as a living document for some period of time in order to collect experience as L4S begins to be deployed in the field. And currently the working group milestone is that um, we're planning on keeping it open for um, a year um, or more after today. So um, that I think is plenty of time, um, hopefully for any um, uh, experience that Comcast gets in their initial deployment to, to be folded in. Um, this draft, um, draft 05, um, the only change is the new title. Um, there um, is, is one to do in the document still, um, but it's really an open place for uh, anyone who has suggestions for ways to uh, analyze the situation and, and uh, ways to, to mitigate uh, any potential issues that might, that might rise. So uh, welcome any comments. Um, on the mailing list and um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep it open. Um, so. Thank you. Any questions? Some people have had a small issue with not being able to contact the data tracker. And if you want to just please go to the mic here while this is happening. If you have questions, Tim, have you got a question or are you playing with the button? That is a question. <laughs> I think there may be a very large buffer on my phone or something. Um, <laughs> so I'm aware of 
work in other groups towards measurement, monitoring and measurement of the impact of putting these things into the network. There's nothing in this draft about that. It's probably not that relevant. How do, how do we hook these things together? Do we just look at, say, IPPM and what's happening there with the responsiveness test? Are there other thoughts you have on measurement of the impact of, of these changes that you would recommend as general guidance for people deploying the systems, how they should measure it? That's an interesting question. Yeah, it certainly isn't the scope of this document, but uh, in general, um, how to measure the performance benefits of, uh, of L4S as it gets deployed. Um, I can say we've done quite a bit of uh, experimentation with that in the interops um, and have developed a sort of a straw man uh, test plan of different uh, uh, test conditions that are more amenable to lab testing really rather than field testing, but, uh, but could, some of them could be used in field testing environments. Um, I think that's uh, an open area for, for further um, work at, and and uh, would be very useful, I think. To, uh, you know, as we start to get L4S deployed in end systems, um, I think as new network equipment starts to get built and, and implementing L4S functionality, um, it's important that uh, there are good ways to test that new equipment at, um, before it goes out in the field and make sure it's doing a good job of uh, doing the CE marking. And then similarly um, for as congestion controls evolve, and new ones get uh, deployed, uh, ensuring that they are okay. performing well, performing fairly, and things like that. So, yeah, yeah, as my button wasn't working for the last talk, maybe Jason is listening and can comment on what Comcast are specifically doing. For example, if there's ga gamers, they will obviously have a qualitative idea, but uh, and many games come with you know some idea of uh, latency to the server or throughput, but that you you don't necessarily see the responsiveness, and just having that number is quite quite a like about the. IPPM, but just having a number that shows responsiveness is quite, quite a nice thing. But I'm just wondering what Jason is, is doing to test that. Or... Tim, maybe we'll take that on the list. I know there's also a L4S interop planned for the next Prague meeting, and this could be an interesting topic to catch up after that, after people had thought about it. And knowing how to measure what tools are available must be an interesting thing to go with this puzzle piece to know about deployment. That's a good segue to the next uh, slide. Um, and Be quick. Yeah, okay. Um, so hijacking a little bit of my time on the uh, operational guidance draft uh, and to give an update on the interop activity. So we uh, have been holding the third uh, uh, L4S interop co-located with the IETF and the IETF uh, hackathon. Um, link to the readout slides from Sunday uh, is there in the middle of the slide. Um, in addition to the IETF interops, Cable Labs has been hosting a series of interops at our facility, um, and um, we'll be planning a, another one um, coming up uh, very soon, um, looking like early September timeframe. And uh, as Gore indicated, at the next IETF uh, in Prague, we will plan on having another interop as well. So if you're interested in participating, um, let me know. Um, certainly, uh, um, the IETF one is easy to sign up for. We do it uh, co-located with the hackathon and we use the hackathon's registration system. So it's easy for anyone to, uh, to attend and, and to join. So please do. All right. Any questions on that? Yes, NQB. Shall we move to NQB then? Yes. All right, so this is an update on the NQB draft. Next slide. So we're at draft 19, um, a quick uh, recap of the status. So we did do a working group last call um, using draft 14 as the source for that. Um, there have been a number of draft updates since that time. Um, most recently the draft 18 and 19, um, I. I pushed uh, earlier this month, and I'll talk a little bit about what is new and different in those. And then uh, a reminder, the milestone is to submit as, as a PS by September 2023, which is coming up pretty quickly. So next slide. So this was the status of draft 17 as of last IETF. 
Um, I had incorporated all of the changes that had been um, discussed in working group last call and, uh, and where we had reached a, a, an agreement as to how to handle them. Um, and then the remaining open topics were put into an issues tracker on GitHub. And there were 13 of them. And the next slide um, shows a screenshot of the, the 13 issues. We can continue on, next slide. Um, there was one then additional comment that was raised at the mic last IETF, which was around this uh, impression that um, some readers could, uh, could come away with uh, reading the text that made it sound like if you mark your packets with the NQB code point, then don't worry about congestion control. You don't need to, to think about that. Um, that certainly was not the intent. Um, and so, um, yeah, go on the next slide, we'll talk a bit about that. So in draft 18, um, that was one of the main things that I tackled there was uh, just kind of scrubbing through the sections of the document, which were a bit uh, unclear on that point. And um, hopefully that is now clear to any new reader that um, congestion control is expected. Uh, in addition, um, added the recommendation that well, if, if you're interested in NQB, if you're interested in getting uh, lower uh, latency for your application um, and you're trying to think of what congestion control mechanism you might use to, to uh, support your application, well, L4S might be a good choice. So that's in there now too. Um, next bullet, uh, significantly more guidance on implementation of a traffic protection function. That was one of the requests in the working group last call comments. Um, so that section has been reworked with um, more examples and more discussion of uh, different options for traffic protection. And then the next bullet, um, and this was a quite a bit of discussion on this over the last year or so around um, the sender uh, rate requirements and what is an upper bound on an application's data rate that, uh, that we think is uh, reasonable to mark with the NQB code point. And we had previously settled on one megabit per second, but that was concerning for some. So we have dropped that down to 500 kilobits and hopefully that is uh, more acceptable and, and we're moving past that issue. Um, the rest were, um, I think uh, I won't maybe go into those in any detail, but uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, draft 19, which was posted just yesterday, um, mainly editorial um, changes here and just uh, making the draft more readable, um, kind of moving some things around a bit to, to kind of uh, um, improve readability really. Um, so that's, that's that, next slide. Okay, so the status of the working group last call issues, um, I believe that all of those are now addressed in draft 19 and Unless I hear otherwise, I'll be marking those as closed um, at, at the end of the week. Um, that one additional issue regarding the lack of congestion control and, and guidance on that, um, I also think that we've covered that. So unless I hear otherwise, that one will be closed. Um, one new issue was raised um, this week, and that was um, around uh, the recommendation uh, about handling of the uh, NQB district code point in uh, future Wi-Fi equipment. And so this draft updates RFC 8325, which is the existing guidance from the IETF on mapping DIFSERF code points to user priority levels in 802.11. Um, the NQB draft, when it talks about that, it talks about mapping the NQB code point to the access category and not directly to a user priority level. And so the suggestion was to um, be consistent with 8325 and point to a specific user priority. I think there's a little bit of discussion that may need to um, happen to, to get the right wording there. Um, but I expect to close that one soon. One other just editorial item I noticed this morning um, that I'll correct as well, um, but those are the only two items that I'm aware of at this point. So, Thanks, Greg. Um, at least for my issues, I think you provided good answers to the text. I like the new text. Um, if other people 
were reading issues or following this document, um, now is the time to go through those issues and check whether the um, words are the words you expect. Um, from my side, I, I'm pretty happy with that. I, I, as a chair, I appreciate trying to align it with the other RFC on 8325 on Wi-Fi and getting the language right there. There are a number of little details in the way that language is used and getting those correct is always good because people read the two documents together. When you have done that, um, I expect you'll have a new revision. When do you think the new revision might be available with the new text? Um, I'm hoping that's less than two weeks. Um, you know, the editorial item I can probably take care of in uh, 10 minutes, but the, the, uh, there may be some discussion on the Wi-Fi um, UP. But hopefully that can be resolved very, very quickly. Um, so let's say yeah. two weeks. I'd hope that the Wi-Fi discussion was related to whether this contradicts or complements the 8325 rather than goes through the, the topic again. Um, the conformance with the standards that are published by the IETF is, is really important, I think. <laughs> okay, um, can we begin a working group last call? It's the last line I see. And I guess... We could ask a question. Do we need to ask questions? We could do a hum. Um, hum if you have read this or a recent version of the draft in that list of recent drafts. Please hum now if you have read this or a recent version of the draft. Please hum no, um, if you think this document is not ready to proceed to IETF um, publication. In other words, that we should not start a working group last call. Please hum if you think we should not start a working group last call. Well, that's useful input to the chairs. Um, the purpose of a working group last call is to get people to read the document and to review it. So I believe that this might be a useful point to think about that process. Um, oh, sorry, yes, I can read out what I found. Um, I, I found that um, people, there were a few people had read this um, version of the document and I did not hear people say um, that they think it's not ready for a working group last call in the hum. Um, Michael Abrams, then. is this on? Yes, yes okay. go ahead. Um, Michael Abramson. So um, I'm in the core network, so I quickly scan the draft, and it, it seems that I'm not supposed to do anything, basically. Uh, but uh, I, even if, if I was running um, an access network, um, it would be interesting to see example configs of common platforms to implement this, because reading the text about like how to uh, treat BE and this the same, but still not building a queue and so on. It's not obvious to me how that should be done. Um, so if there is any, might not have to go into the draft, but something like that would be of interest. Okay. Um, uh, Martin. Someone's ahead of me in the queue. No, Michael. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, Martin Duke, I just want to relay from, from um, Zula. Sebastian Muller says, I would hum for not doing WGLC as this should not be published. Always good to have feedback. Thank you for um, relaying that. Of course, the purpose of the Wigan Group last call is to seek consensus. So um, uh, we will invite everybody to read this document in the upcoming period. And we should expect a working group must call of this for putting on the agenda at the, IE, at the Prague IETF meeting. So in the period from now till then. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Where are we with time? We have 15 minutes and we have done. Um, I think we allocate the whole of the 15 minutes to the, the presentation and discussion of this. Please allow time for discussing this done as well. Okay. I'll get through this one. one. One quick note. If you're in the room, please sign into the data tracker tool. Um, we've also passed around the blue sheets and they haven't made it back yet. So I assume they have, must have gotten stuck somewhere. Thank you. And go ahead now. 
<clears throat> so I'm Dan Wang. I'm here to talk about uh, using UDP trailers uh, with uh, encrypted transports. And yes, we do have a misspelling in the file name of the draft. So when you look for it, you'll notice that. Next slide, please. Uh, so the problem we're uh, attempting to solve is mostly cellular networks wanting to prioritize and manage traffic. So certain traffic is more important than other traffic inside of one flow. So um, my company, one example, I work at Citrix, things like keystrokes and mouse movements are more important than a file transfer that is all occurring over that same five tuple. And we'd like the network to have the ability to police that. And, and when it is congested to drop the things that are less important that we can go ahead and retransmit. Same old story. A couple of IAB documents that are related to this that encourage some sort of hint in communication to the network at a high level. Next slide. Uh, we looked at uh, V6 hop by hop. One of our, our big constraints there is V4. And then of course, how V6 hop by hop are destroyed on the path is a summary of this slide. Next slide, please. So the, the solution that we are proposing is for the sender to uh, obtain keys. I have a, a quickie on the next slide showing how to do that. And then show, uh, show uh, encrypt the tag uh, and stick it in a UDP option. So it's a, a trailer of the, between the UDP payload and the end of the IP payload. Uh, and then the necessary network elements, most likely the access network, so the last top router, can process that UDP trailer, authenticate it, authorize that this seems like a good tag, I like it, I like the sender, I'm in a good mood and I'm gonna do what it says, or I'm gonna take the, the network management treatment that it is encouraging me to do. And this works for V4 and V6. Next slide. So the interesting and, and important thing here is um, this is a modern approach to an age old problem, you know, that we've tried with RSVP and DiffServe and a bunch of other attempts. Um, so we are encrypting or obfuscating that signal uh, so that other devices on the path don't know why it's being signaled, what's being signaled, uh, and don't have any hint about how important that packet is to the sender. So that means they're shared intentionally with only the devices that understand how to decrypt that data. <clears throat> We're integrity protecting it as well, and we de decouple it from the endpoint protocol um, on purpose. Next slide, please. So the interesting thing on this slide is the scope of this document is just transport. So it's that circle at the bottom up at the top is how the key is obtained. You know, the diagram sort of implies that the access network goes in both directions. It may only go in one direction. It sort of implies that it makes a connection out. We don't care how any of that works. That's the out of scope part. And how that key is obtained is, is not what we're discussing and, and worried about with the draft that we have here in, um, and, and brought to the TSVWG. And that's it for my slides. Which now brings us to questions. Matt? Uh, Matt Joris, Meta. So um, I may email the authors about this, but um, some people may have seen that we presented very spiritually similar work at Dispatch, um, where the general idea being that you want to secure information exchange between a network device and an endpoint. Um, I think this is broadly speaking covered under the same scope. Um, and I don't think that it's appropriate to be adopted by into TSVWG, uh, given the feedback we've received both from dispatch and from the side meeting, most of which is that um, there's, a, there's a lot going on here in terms of understanding the various implications of standardizing a way to exchange information from a content endpoint and any device on the network. Um, so that's, that's kind of my feedback. I would say uh, we are, 
the, our, our dispatch feedback was to have a broth. And so we're probably going to do that. I think that this, the, it, this would be very reasonably covered under that same scope. I, I can confirm that this is a topic that's been on TSBWG's agenda many times over the time I've been chairing and before I was chairing. And it likely does fall within the scope of this working group if the method is in this direction or any method using D RSVP, DSCPs, et cetera. So the topic li lies here. And I don't think we're going to take an adoption call today. So um, please coordinate. We, we, we'd, love to, we'd love to work with you as chairs and um, interested in your both, yeah. Yeah, and we would certainly like to be part of that buff in progress. Who's next? Tom. Hi, uh, Tom Herbert. So my comments on this are pretty much the same uh, as the other day when we were talking about the wireless media header. Fundamentally, this is, you have to admit, not architecturally correct, right? Because we're placing network layer information inside the transport layer, and we're expecting intermediate devices to process that data. So that kind of contradicts uh, some of the core architecture of the internet. But more importantly, for this proposal and UDP options, I understand the appeal of something shiny and new, but they don't have deployment. There are a lot of issues, even in, even in this model, for instance, we don't know in the network when we see something with surplus area, we cannot prove that that's actually UDP option. That could be something else. There's no code point that identifies that. There's also going to be other practical issues like having middle boxes process protocol trailers. So there's a long list. And I noticed that you had uh, one slide um, on IPv6 extension headers. And this is a common theme, by the way. So this is like the fourth proposal I've seen at this IETF where people want to signal the network from the host. So it's a common problem. And the answer for IPv6 extension headers is always the same. Oh, we can't use them. They're not usable. Um, this had a new twist. Uh, you actually mentioned uh, the hop by hop processing draft, which is interesting. But I would point out that draft is not necessary to actually process hop by hop options. It doesn't really change anything. So what I see is there's a need for this network signaling from the host. It's a common problem. I tend to think we should do the IETF way, which is find a common solution that addresses all of this. And the other, the other issue I'd point out, um, yes, hop a hop options doesn't work for IPv6, but on the other hand, UDP options doesn't work for TCP, doesn't work for SCTP. So there's always gonna be these limitations. What's the most generic mechanism moving forward? So, like I said, my comments are pretty much the same. Um, Gory, you, you made an interesting point the other day in, in the poll. The area has a lot of interest. There's no doubt about that. However, since this is about signaling network layer information, I do have to wonder if this might be more an interior thing. Maybe we can talk about that offline. But um, So I see the need, um, but I think these proposals, I. I I think they're creative, but I don't see how they could ever be standardized because of all the lim limitations. I can respond on the area thing. The, thing. the QoS aspects of this falls within this group. If Interior wants to define a generic encapsulation or a generic network-wide signaling method, they can do that. But the quality of service-related pieces, in other words, configuring the queues, et cetera, falls here. Right, so it's not so much the contents of the signal that I'm worried about, it's the carrier. So the carry, putting the carrier in a transport layer that intermediate devices process, I think that's going to be a, a hard thing to get through um, it's, standard. It's totally okay with the internet architecture to add that header um, and to pass it in equipment that does it. It's the added value question. So it's the end-to-end -end principle of whether you need to see it or you don't need to see it, et cetera. So we can debate this here. Yep. Thanks for the input, Tom. Um, sorry, uh, Dan, I cut you off. Did you want to say more? No, I'm good. Okay, then let's have the next slide. Next speaker is Christian. Christian. 
Well, I, I was in the queue. Uh, I pretty much agree with uh, what the previous speaker just said. I mean, this is not a UDP option function. UDP fun option are described as end-to-end. -end. That means that they are supposed to be used by the transport, by both end of the transport, not by the intermediary. It's actually said in the draft. So either the draft means it or it doesn't. If the UDP draft doesn't mean what it says, and it means that, hey, we are defining this thing, which is, quote, end-to-end, -end, but in fact, what it is being used for is to send information to the middle boxes, then that's a big issue. And I think that as a general principle, we should not use UDP options for things that are not end-to-end. -end. If we need a mechanism to send data to the network, that mechanism should be architected as such and not be part of a side effect of the UDP options. And in fact, that reinforced my, my idea that we should definitely not use UDP options with encrypted transports. Thanks. Next person in queue. As a quick note, we have four minutes left and four people in the queue. So please keep your comments brief. Uh, Kenji, uh, China Mobile. Actually, I, I like this idea, excellent idea here, because uh, we have a real case uh, in the field. Well, uh, we mentioned about the 3GBP XR uh, extended reality, multimodality is uh, on the downstream. It needs uh, quite a few different uh, streams with uh, the datagram will have a different uh, importance or critical quality, all kinds of things that will need to be differentiated upon the, uh, well, it's called the last hop or not the last hop, but it's called UPF um, in coming to the 5GS. So there are some way try to handle it. Well, it's like uh, we can use the, the UDP, like the media header uh, ID draft but the people consider, okay, that might, it's going to violate the end-to-end -end because the UDP is for the, uh, the source to destination part. The thing is, I can argue this one is for the 5GS. It's like a composite receiver. It includes the UE as the uh, UDP client and also the UPF that can do the routing. So if you make the 5GS as, the, as a transparent box or black box, actually it's a composite destination for the end-to-end -end on this way. The second thing is if the, the stream is encrypted. So while well, the thing like we have to find a way to do it, the UDP option actually, I think it's better. We have uh, actually, I've submitted a draft about uh, you know, how to map the three GPP thing through the UDP part. Yeah, so, and this one is for the security. If you have to do like people think, okay, the security things, the tag, it actually is some potential solution for that thing. So out of the three points, I support this one, thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Um, next is Mike. Mike, go ahead, your remote. Uh, have you got me now? Yes. Okay. I won't repeat uh, uh, any comments by Tom and Christian, which I largely agree with. Um, I saw some things in the draft specifically that I wanted to caution the authors about. Uh, there was a proposal to use auth and UANC, if I understood it correctly. And those things are very, very controversial and may not make it to, uh, uh, may not be in the draft when it's actually uh, published as an RFC. So please keep that in mind. Um, another thing, uh, and it wasn't obvious from reading the uh, draft, and maybe it's because I didn't put enough time in, but I see on this last slide something that implies that uh, the network is modifying these options in transit. Uh, and that would, that, uh, it would be nice if the uh, authors could clarify that point. Uh, thank you. That's all I have. So there's uh, no modification of the packets. So sorry, these are three separate packets just showing that they have different tag, two of them have different tag values, but they're three separate packets. They're not being modified. And we also do not strip the tags. They survive all the way through. Kazuo? 
thank you for the presentation. I think it's good that the information is encrypted. However, I think there's a privacy concern that is that we are essentially creating a mechanism that can be used for middleboxes asking endpoints disclose information to have better treatment. That seems like a slightly dangerous slope to me. And regarding the requirements, um, I mean, if we need this kind of signaling, it seemed to me that the premise was that we need this signal, otherwise switches might drop. But with ECN becoming more common, it is my understanding that packets would not get dropped and that they would be, and the sender can decide what it would drop when it sends at the next round trip. Assuming that is the case, I wonder how much strong need we have for this kind of mechanism that indicates how switches should drop packets instead of asking them to implement ECN. Thanks. I, I'm not Thanks. addressing comments. We don't have a lot of time. So. Whoops. Um, you, you can address comments, but we would love to drain the queue. Um, yep, so have, if you're, you're in the queue, please come to the mic, Tim. And we have Marco currently in the queue. Uh, hi, Tim Chan. Yes, well, one of the authors of one of the other, Tom mentioned four or five things that have been presented at this ITF, trying to do this sort of marking. Very keen to speak to others to gather requirements and see if we can come up with some. These common requirements, you people don't all use it. We would love to use hop by hop because it's V6 only, our, our use case. Um, but love, love to talk to others. Thanks, Tim. Hey there. Um, I think IPX extension headers seem generally more useful. And I think it'd be better to push for more support of that rather than inventing something new that might also have similar problems when deployed. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Dan still gets the opportunity to find a word if you wish. <laughs> well, thanks for your attention on this. Uh, one, one point on the architectural question that came up several times is um, the, um, the waste of the internet is UDP. Um, it's no longer IP. Um, we can blame uh, Nats on that. So I guess that's partly, uh, partly on me for co-chairing Behave for so many years, but uh, they're here anyway. <laughs> um, but that, that's where the waste is, and that's why um, we have moved this, you know, have brought this proposal here. And yes, it, it moves things up in the stack into an unpleasant place that is uh, uncomfortable. Um, but we would really love to have a solution to this longstanding problem um, that we've, we've been attempting to tackle for a couple decades. Thanks. And my last question to Dan, what's your intentions for the next meeting? Are you intending to carry this on? Uh, participate in the uh, BOF. Um, and I would like, um, you know, some refinement on the stuff on top, which, you know, is you know, someone else's uh, document and someone else's interest, I expect. Um, and we'll do a rev or two of, of our own doc uh, to clarify a lot of the comments that we received here today. Thank you ever so much for that. Thanks, Dan. Right, um, we're over Thank time. You. Thank you for all coming to this meeting. Uh, we will hold uh, two sessions in Prague or request them. There will be working group last calls coming up on the list. Have a good lunch. <laughs>